I hope everybody's having a great day today so far. The sun is out, thank God. The winter is ending and spring is beginning, which also hopefully means that Geula is starting, this with the Shem. And if not collectively, then for sure personally. Today's class, we should be attached to all the true tzaddikim who are alive today, all the true tzaddikim who are buried in the earth, and to the tzaddik is Olam, to Rabbi Nachum and Fei Gazal, uh, in whose schut we're all together right now. The Arizal used to have as students, they were called the friends. So I hope, Bezrat Hashem, one day we should uh, feel the same way about each other. Uh, Rabbi Nachman says, that uh, the unity and the brotherhood and the love of his students is the, is the key to bringing down his teachings. And it's the same by the Arizal and all the great Siddiquim. So uh, I have a dream one day, but we're all going to meet up from the four corners of the globe and have a big Sion party, this with Shem one day. So hopefully it'll be Amen. soon. Amen. <laughs> so to Shem. We could all share our stories there. You know, Rabbi Nachman says that every single one of his students is going to have his story written down. So, Bezat uh, Hashem, one day uh, we should be able to talk about our stories together. Um, so, Rav Natan says like this: Therefore, it's necessary that we get up exactly at midnight. Why? The Shaber Toke Fashena. Because we need to break this false ideology that's called sleep. The Shabert Bechina Tahoshech Valayla. We need to break this concept of darkness, this concept of nighttime. Jubechina Tokef Agalut. That's the concept of the strength of the exile. Hanim Shala Layla. That Rabbi, that, the, that Hashem may actually created the nighttime. It's a nimshal. It's an example, it's a parallel for exile. That just like nighttime, you don't see anything. So too in exile, you can't see Hashem. Just like in nighttime, there's no clarity. So too uh, in the exile, there's no clarity. And the list goes on and on and on. That the nighttime, according to the Hasidic masters, is a manifestation of the exile. And the Chiddush of Rav Natan and Rabbi Nachman is that the whole cause of nighttime is the concept of nature. And Badafka, our investment in our hearts and minds in the absolute reality of nature. That nature or science has become our Zara of 2021. That we believe that the five senses and whatever can be measured by them, speculative science, theories, um, medicine, doctors, that these are God, that they are the end all be all. And Rabbi Nachman and Rav Natan say, Chas v'shalom, that this is a tremendous danger because ultimately what you're doing is you're causing your own exile. Shemisham ikar galut, because it's from there that the essence of exile for every person, both male and female, both Jewish and not Jewish, both individually and collectively, it's all drawn from this place of limitation that we've invested ourselves in a limited reality that's called nature. And as a result of that, we feel darkness and confusion in our life. Every single Jewish man and woman needs we need to wake up. And Badafka, we need to wake up when everybody's sleeping. In the heart of everybody's sleep, that's at Chatzot, that's at midnight. That we should break for ourselves this firm belief, this core belief that we need to be sleeping. This core belief that nighttime is the time for us to turn off our minds and hearts and to give up. And it's Badafka at this time that we need to nullify this investment within us in this false reality of Chokhmat Ateva. And you do this by literally waking up from your sleep at nighttime and by breaking this sleep. 
Ba'al can, and therefore, shekhamim b'chatzot, when a person, he wakes up at chatzot, az mit avlin alagalut. That's the reason why, specifically, we are mourning on the loss of the Beit HaMikdash at that time at chatzot. What's the connection between the two? Shegalu Yisrael me'artam. Because the whole entire exile is that we've been exiled from our land. And according to Chassidut and Kabbalah, what is this land called? It's called Emuna. What is Eretz Yisrael? It's Eretz Emuna. The Rabbi Nachman teaches in the seventh Torah of the Kutumran that the land of Israel is a physical manifestation. It's a living space of consciousness. The consciousness is that of Emuna. It's that of simple belief. That Hashem is all that exists. Ein o milvado. That there is nothing else besides the infinite light of Hashem. That He's the cause of everything that takes place. That He is the orchestrator and conductor of reality. That He is the mover of all chess pieces and all parts. And when a person firmly believes in this and lives with this in his heart and his mind, he's called living in the land of Israel. And this is the deep secret from the Gemara that it says that for any Jew that lives in the land of Israel, it's like he has a God. And for those who live outside of the land, it's like they don't have a God. Because it's like. Because if you live in the land of Israel, meaning you have a moon, a shlema, you have complete faith in Hashem. Then as a result of that, it's like you actually have God in your life. Because the benefit of Hashem in your life is having a moon. And if you don't have a moon, then the Gemara is saying there's really no benefit to having Hashem in your life. Because it's your Bechira, it's your choice to let Hashem in or not. And if you don't have a moon, then as a result of that, you're outside of the land. And then it's like you don't have a God. And that doesn't mean Chas Vashon, that Hashem's not there. It doesn't mean He cares about you any less. It doesn't mean He's not mourning and pining over you to come back to Him. It doesn't mean He's not thinking about you at every single moment about how to bring you back. It simply means it's like you don't have him. And the reason is because you don't believe in him. And not just the belief that he exists, but like Rabbi Nachman says, the core belief of Amuna is that he's Mechadish, that he renews reality at every moment. And this goes in complete contradistinction to nature, that it's the same, that it never changes, that the laws are invoyable, inviolable. I forget this word. But that this can't change. And that's the whole cause of Yeush. It's the whole cause of despair. I have this crappy job. I'm always going to have this crappy job. I'm in a bad relationship with my wife. It's always going to be a bad relationship. My children are off the derech. They don't listen. They're always going to be like that. I have bad health. I'm always going to have bad health. I am depressed. I have this uh, inclination that causes me constantly to be sad, I'm always going to be sad. I'm anxious right now. I'm terrified of what's going to happen. I'm never going to shake this anxiety. All of this is coming from an investment in Teva, in nature, in belief that things can't change. But when you believe Maasei Bereshi Tamid, that Hashem recreates everything at every moment, you mamish have invested your heart and soul in that reality. And the proof of that is that you learn Rabbi Nachman's teachings every day, you live with those teachings every day, you talk to Hashem for at least an hour a day, if not more, you're constantly trying to bring this belief into your heart and mind that Hashem is machadish. Then you will have left the Laila, then you will have Shaber, you have broken chain of the sleep. But Alken Az Azman Latakenzot. And therefore, this is the specific time that you need to get up to mourn over the loss of the Beit HaMikdash, meaning to mourn over the loss of the Da'at, the knowing that Hashem is the cause of everything. It's Badafka then, because sleep is the cause of it. So when do we mourn over the loss of the Beit HaMikdash, meaning the loss of this felt reality that Hashem is the orchestrator of my life? That we need to do Badafka in the heart of the sleep. And that itself is what breaks it. Because we know, according to Kabbalah, according to Hasidut, according to the Torah, we see with Moshe Rabbeinu that when the Jewish people needed healing, Hashem sent Moshe to a bitter water source. And he said, throw this bitter stick in this bitter water. 
And as a result of that happening, it actually became sweet. So we see that the paradox of life and the paradox of Hashem's rachamim is that the actual bitterness itself is what causes the healing. That when you're able to utilize the darkness in the right way, that's actually the cause of the redemption itself. And this is the secret of Mashiach ben David, that it's his consistent fight with the klipot. It's his consistent being barraged by all of the forces of externality and physicality, of taiva, of desire, of confusion, of dilbu, of feeling that Hashem is not in his life. It's that actual experience that leads him to be the Mashiach itself. Because his whole entire avoda, which he brings into the world, is that of Amuna. And you don't need Amuna when you know. You need Amuna when you don't know. And that can only come about, that can only be tapped into, that can only be strengthened and realize that potential can only be actualized at nighttime. This is very Kedai since literally we just had Pesach. Therefore, the first Geula, which you're going to see Rav Natan constantly refers to the first Geula and the final Geula, because even though there's been many redemptions and many exiles, so to speak, there's two archetypal exiles and redemptions. That is the original exile and the final exile. The original Geula and the final Geula. These are called Yitzhak Mitzrayim, and this is called Yomot Mashiach. So Rav Natan says, Geula Rishona Mitzrayim. Therefore, the first Geula is called going out of Mitzrayim. Shekola Koagaliot. Because Mitzrayim is the encompassment of all the exiles. Because there's a famous teaching of Chazal and Bereshit Rabbah that all exiles, both collectively and personally, whether it's the exile of Rome or the exile of Greece or the exile of Babylon or the exile of Persia, the exile of Rome, the exile of Spain, the exile of Germany, the exile of Western civilization, the exile of radical Islam, all of these things which have afflicted the Jewish people collectively. Now let's go personally, whether you suffer from depression or you suffer from anxiety or you suffer from confusion, you suffer from low self-esteem, you suffer from trauma or abuse or addiction. All of these things are called one thing, Mitzrayim. And the reason is very simple because Mitzrayim, even though it's called Egypt, when we translate it, Mitzrayim literally translates as constriction, limitation, sorrow, suffering. So anytime you're suffering, it's called you're in the land of Mitzrayim. And you have a leader who's called Paro and you have his henchmen and they're constantly making you work and toil and be enslaved to these beliefs which you are invested in, that you're stuck and you're toast and you're done and it's never going to change. Like our Rebbe Akadosh says, Bakom Acher, and another place in the Kutmaran, Simon Dalet Otet. Al Ken Hitchila Geula Bechatot Elayla. Therefore, the initial breakthrough, the initial emergence from this place of suffering, it happens at Chatzot at nighttime, Mamish. It happens at midnight, Mamish. Kamoshikatuv, like it says in Shemot. That Hashem says that like at the time of Chatzot, I'm going to go out within Mitzrayim. That it's specifically at Chatzot that Hashem is going to come and save you. Kikar koha galiut. Sorry. Kikar koha geulot. Because the essence of all the redemptions, bifrat, whether it's specifically the geulot at Mitzrayim, and specifically the Geul of Mitzrayim, Hu It's all encompassed within what we're speaking about right now. It's all through the Hashkacha, it's all through the orchestration that is drawn from Hashem Yiparach, from the end of existence, from the world to come. Because, like we said in the past, that all hashkacha pratit, even though it exists constantly in this world, 
And for those who have eyes to see, it never ceases. But the Chiddush of Rabbi Nachman is that Hashkacha Pratit doesn't actually come from this world. It's drawn from the future. It's drawn from Olam Haba. If you can imagine this entire physical world is like a body without a soul. And the soul is existing concurrently or parallel to it in Olam Haba. So too within yourself, you have a body which is called Olam Hazeh. And you have a consciousness. You have a Neshama. You have a spark of godliness, Mamish. But it's not from this world. It's from Olam Haba. And for the Jew who connects to that spark while he's in this world, he experiences redemption. He experiences Geula in his life. Wow, this must be very important. I literally keep getting a phone call from the same person over and over and over again. I'm so sorry, everybody. When you leave Mitzrayim, this is called Shidud Amarach Uvital Ateva. There's a fourth time. For That's the amount of exiles we've been in, by the way. For the Jewish people to leave Mitzrayim, for you to leave your suffering, for you to leave your exile, you must completely shatter, trample, destroy your belief in nature. Ki az gila shemi barach hashkachato yadei hamovtim naraot shasu azu vital atepa. Because then Hashem will redeem you with his hashkacha, with his providence, with his orchestration, through wonders that are awesome, that are miraculous, that are above nature, azu vital ateva. And he will completely shatter your concept of nature. And all of this is all through the world to come. Kimisitra de Yovla Nafku. Because it says in Tikkuni Zohar, it says in Zohar Kadosh. That it's from the side of the Yovel. I can't believe this. That was the most times anybody's ever called me. It was literally eight times in a row. Hashem, please, that we should get through this class. Nisidra de Yovla Nafku. From the side of Yovel, it's going to go out. We know Yovel means freedom. There are 49 years that we go through a Shemitah cycle. That is, every six years in the land of Israel, we work the land. On the seventh year, it's supposed to be Shemitah. That is, we don't do anything with the land, it's left fallow. And Hashem promises us that we're going to have in the sixth year enough to cover us for the next two. This is a parallel to the days of the week and Shabbat. But then you have this 50th, right? We know that we went down into the 49 gates of Tuma. So we had to go all the way out. And 50 always represents redemption. 50 always represents Geula. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to get to the 50th gate of understanding. We know it's the 50th gate of Bina. And in Kabbalah, it's, it's explained that even though Malchut is like the Shabbat, meaning the six days of the week are like the six lower spherot. The seventh day is like Shabbat. But ultimately, when you go through seven of these cycles and you get to the 50th, the 50th is corresponding not to the lower Shekhinah, which is called Malchut or Shabbat, but it's co corresponding to the Yovel or Olam Haba. And this is called Bina. This is the world to come. That's the place that nature gets obliterated completely. That's the place of Yomot Mashiach. That's the place of freedom, of Cheirut. That's the place of Geula. Shubachinat Chamishim Sharei Bina. This is the concept of the 50th gates of Bina. And this is the secret, by the way, of why, if you look in the Torah, that Yetzirah Mitzrayim is mentioned 50 times exactly. That the concept of going out of Mitzrayim is, is, is listed in the Torah, in the Chumash, 50 times exactly, to correspond to how many times we need to leave behind and to shatter Teva in our life in order before we can finally manifest the concept of 
geula of redemption of Hashkacha Pratis. And by the way, it's very kadai to know that what was that 50th gate of Tuma according to the Hasidic masters, which fits in very well with what you're saying. That is that the 50th gate of Tuma, if we ever would have reached there, we never would have been able to come back from it. And what is that? That's the concept of yeush, of despair. So what's the opposite of yeush? What's the opposite of despair? It's a muna. It's a muna in Om Haba. It's a, mo- it's a muna in Ashkacha Pratis. It's a muna in divine providence. It's a muna in things can change right now. Everything can flip in one moment. And it's the reason why Hashem brought the Geula at midnight specifically. Dainu meaning Shaber at Alayla Vachoshech, because he wanted to break the nighttime for the Jewish people. He wanted to show that the whole concept of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, of Paro, of Teva, of nature, he wanted to shatter it at its source. Shem Bechina Teva, because they are the concept of nature. Vegila Ashkacha Olam, and they, he wanted to reveal at that moment the Ashkacha in the world. And through this, you have the essence of the Geula. This is the concept of, and all the firstborn died in the land of Mitzrayim. And Hashem skipped from place to place. And he saved all the firstborn of the Jewish people. Because like Rabbi Nachman teaches in the first Torah, the Kutu Moran, that the, the concept of the Bechor, the concept of the firstborn, the concept of the birthright that was given to us is not the free trip to Israel, which we all yearn and pine for. But it's the real trip to Israel, the real uh, coast-to-coast flight that we experience in the land of Israel, that is the land of Amunah Shlema. That when a Jew experiences a Muna Shlema, he has now achieved his inheritance, his birthright. This is the Bachor. This is the Reishi that it says in the beginning of the Torah, Reishi bar lokim at the Shemayim bet the Aretz. That for the sake of Reishi, the Shem created Shemayim Aretz, meaning for the sake of a Muna Shlema that Hashem wanted to give to us, which is the ultimate good, the ultimate Tov. Like it said about Abraham, that he got Bakol, and that Yitzchak got me coal, and that Yaakov had coal. Everything. What's the gematria of coal? 50. Meaning Amuna. This was the thing in which Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov got, which is our inheritance for the future in the times of Mashiach. It's coal. It's 50. It's the Nun. It's Geula. It's Amuna. Da'at. The concept of knowing that everything comes from Hashem. Bechinat reishi da'at, like the Pasuk says in Mishlei, the beginning of da'at, which is to say not just that it's the beginning of knowing, but that reishi is da'at. Knowing that Hashem is the cause of everything, this is the reishi. This is the source. This is the epicenter. This is the highest point of consciousness. Hainu shichnia da'at. Meaning that when you subdue the knowledge of the Sitra Akhra, of the other side, which is the knowledge of nature only, and you strengthen the knowledge of holiness, which is the knowledge of Hashem being the orchestrator of all of reality. Like Hashem said to us, my son, my firstborn of Israel, meaning when are you my firstborn? When you believe that in the Bachur, when you believe in me completely, that when you believe I can do anything for you at any moment, and I want to, and I'm yearning to, and I'm pining to, and I'm waiting for you to believe that I can truly, that when you have this belief, you have attained the birthright, and now you're my Ben, you're my son. And when can you do this? Do you have to wait forever? When can this be? Comes David Amalek to teach in Tilim in the second parak, says Hayom. I give birth to you today, my son, Hayom. That if you do this right now, 
If you internalize Amuna right now, if you leave behind your investment in the false reality that's called Teva, nature alone, and you go talk to Hashem for an hour today. So right that moment, you're Hashem's son. Because you're called his Bechor at that moment. And in order for us to leave Mitzrayim, the Bechor of Mitzrayim has to die. Meaning Teva has to die for you. Nature has to die for you. And your Bechor has to be saved. That is, your Amuna Shlema has to come out. Meaning your knowledge of the belief in Hashem's hashkacha, of Hashem's providence, that it's from there that is drawn the true seed of the holiness of the Jewish people. Because it's taught and it's known that the Jewish people have no mazal, that we're above the mazal, but we're only above the mazal when we believe that. Because our souls are drawn from above nature. Like Hashem showed Abraham and he took him outside and he said, Look up at Shemaim and count all the stars. And he said to him, thus will be your children. Now, according to the Hasidic masters, there's a very deep secret here. Habet na shamaima. Look up now at Shamaim. Uswar Kochavim. And count all the stars. But we know that Spirit of Omer, which we're talking about right now, which is very Kadai, is not just a matter of the counting of the days, but the word Sphira also means to illuminate. That the Kiddush that Hashem was telling Abraham was that you're going to be the Mashiach. Look now in Shamaim. Because what you're going to see is all of your descendants. And guess what these descendants are? They're stars. They're luminaries. But where are they getting their light from? They're getting their light all from the Tzadik Yesod Alam. They're getting it all from you. How are they going to get this light? How are these stars going to light up when you illuminate them? And how is Avraham going to illuminate the light of the stars? How is Avraham Avinu, the Tzadik Yesod Alam, going to illuminate all of our inner realities so that we can shine bright and cause that in this exile, in this darkness that we're all suffering from, that we could be a light unto the nations of the world. It's through Amuna. Because Rabbi Nachman teaches a secret in the Sichot Aran that when he said, see thus, these are all your children. Rabbi Nachman says, what's the secret of children? He says, emuna, that emuna is the secret of children. And how do you see this? Because the gematria banim, children, is 102. The gematria of emuna is 102. That is to say that children is called emuna. The concept of a Jewish child is called another uh, living reality of faith. Like Chazal teach that we are believers and sons of believers and daughters of believers. That is to say, when are they going to be called your children? When are we going to really be called B'nai Abraham, B'nai Yitzchak, B'nai Yaakov? When we have Amuna, then we're the children of Yisrael. And then we're going to shine like the stars. And this is what our Chazal teaches Mibaraba when it says, that he lifted Abraham above the stars. That's what it meant that he took him chutzah. He literally lifted him above the stars and he looked down at them. Because Hashem wanted to show him, even though physically your body is down here, your soul is not down here. Your soul is way above this world. And it's from that point that you exist. Not down here in your lowliness. That's just for the sake of this great, beautiful movie, which is called My Story, that I want to reveal my light in the darkest places. But your ability to do that is to know that even though your feet are on the ground, your head is in Shemayim. Your head is above the stars. Nimsa, consequently, Shazera Yisrael, the seed of Yisrael, Nimshachin Lamalam Etavan, because Avram Avinu, who is our father, comes from above Shemayim. We are also all coming from above Shemayim. Ki al piateva kifima rechet hashemayim, because through Teva, according to the stars and the constellations of Shemayim, lo ya Avram Avinu, there is no Avram Avinu, Chas Shalom. 
Avraham Avinu was not able to give birth because we know according to the astrologers, Avraham was not give, uh, uh, able to give birth according to the stars. Which on paper, I'm sure in his life, was a source of tremendous suffering. But here is the big secret for every single one of us. Because Hashem wanted him give, to give birth, not just to a son, not just to a child. He wanted him to give birth to Banim, to Amuna. And for that, he needed to reach above the stars. And the only way for him to do that is not be able to give birth according to the laws of nature. And this is the deep secret for every one of us in our lives. Why is it that I have physical health problems that can't be cured by doctors? Why is it that I have uh, bouts of sadness and anxiety that I have not been able to kick through years of therapy and psychiatric medications? Why is it that I deal with addiction and nothing is able to stop the desire, the intensity of this fervor for which I pine for this thing, which is so destructive for me in my life? Why is it that I can't simply just have this belief in Hashem? And the answer is because Hashem will not allow you to believe in nature. He will not allow you to feel that you are the result of the stars or the physical world or nature or science. Because then you won't be able to give birth to the spiritual child which Hashem brought you to this world for. To give birth to real Banim, to Zera Yisrael, to Amuna. For that you're going to need to shaver, destroy, break, shatter nature completely. And through this, you're going to realize that you're above the laws of nature. And like Rabbi Nachman says, you will take your place in this world in your rightful place, which is above the Malachim, which is above the angels, which is above the stars, above Shemaim. Rak ayadei shamar lo shemi parach. This is only Through, like that said to him, Hashem Yiparach, say, Umitz tagniu tshecha. Go out from these astrologers that are to you. That Hashem had to tell Abraham, forget about the astrologers. Forget about science. Forget about nature. Forget about whatever you've experienced in your life. Go rise up. Go ascend. Go above Shemayim. Go above nature. And it's through this that you're going to merit to give birth to children, to offspring, to fruit, that you won't be a barren mule anymore, like the people around you are saying, but you're going to give birth to something that's going to last forever. And you're going to be able to give over to your children and your children's children. Nimsa, consequently, consequently, that the seed of Israel is drawn from this root that is above nature. This is the concept of the firstborn of Israel that was saved from Paro by Hashem Yiparach. This is what Paro wanted to uh, throw in the river. This is what he wanted to kill when he wanted to take the firstborn Jewish boys. What it really means is he wanted to take our highest point of consciousness that is a Muna Shlema and he wanted to kill it and destroy it. And he did it by making us work and work and work and not be able to breathe and not be able to think, not be able to talk to Hashem, like Rabbi Nachman says. And we need to kill the firstborn of Mitzrayim. But when does that happen? It happens at midnight. That's when it's subdued and destroyed and nullified the knowledge of science and the laws of nature as being unavoidable, unchangeable, unalterable. And we're going to strengthen and we're going to elevate our knowledge and belief in Hashem's Hashkacha Pratit. That they are the concept of the firstborn of the children of Israel. And by the way, this is the uh, beautiful secret of the Pesach table. That Rabbi Nachman says that Avram Avinu is sitting at the table and he has four children there. Yitzchak, Esav, Yaakov, and Yishmael. They're all his banim. They're all his amuna. And he got all of that by looking up 
and going above the stars and realizing he's not from this world. He's from something way above this place. And this is the key to us as well, like Rabbi Nachman teaches in the story of the exchange servant, that even though we think we're lowly, that we think we're low lives, that we think that we're nothing, we think we're just people, that we're uh, terrestrial beings, but really we are way above this physical world, that it's taught in Kabbalah, that the point of our soul goes above all of the spiritual worlds, above Asiya, above Yetzira, above Bria, above Atzilut, that the highest point of our soul is literally a piece of God, a piece of the infinite one. I'm going to give a meditation for today, Bezvet Hashem, and then we're going to move into questions. And we'll continue with the Kutumaran tonight at 9 p.m. So do not miss it, because it's a very, very important lesson. Very important lesson. So please be there physically if you're in the area. It's much more effective to be there in the class. Stay the whole class. Don't bring your cell phone so you have a chance to soak in the light and live with it. And if you're not in the area, so please join in on Zoom. So we know, like we said yesterday, that there's two main things that we say in Sefirat Omer. We say over the day, we're on the ninth day right now, which is Givura of Givura, which we learned yesterday that Chesed represents revelation. Givura represents concealment. So if you had a rough night last night or you're having a rough day today, there's a very, very good chance. It's because we're in the Givura of Givura day. This is the... Chastar Shabato Chastar, the concealment within the concealment. And now we're going to find out what is a very good meditation that we can focus on when Hashem is hidden from us completely. If you look at the menorah, where we have Lama Tzech, we know it's more, Shir, which is the 67th parak of Tilim which we say, <clears throat> after we say Spirit to Omer, when we count the day, you'll see that what we're up to is the second shaft in the menorah. Yesterday was Lada'a, that was Chesed of Gevorah, to know, like we're saying now, to know Hashem is controlling every aspect of your life, to know that He's doing everything because He loves you, to know that everything that He does, whether it's good or bad, is only to bring you closer to Him. And the next word, which is very fitting for the day of Givur of Givur, is Ba'aretz. To know Ba'aretz in the land. According to Kabbalah and Chasidut, the land represents Malchut. Malchut is like the moon. The land is the female dimension of spirituality. That according to Kabbalah, the beauty of the moon, it has nothing of its own. And the issue with the land is when it has something of its own. So when your consciousness, which is called the land, is filled up with ego, is filled up with self, and specifically the belief that I am all that there is, and nature is all that there is, that's called the malchut of the sitra achra. But when a person achieves humility, a person achieves ani lo yodei, I don't know anything, and I believe with simple faith that Hashem is the cause of everything that's taking place in my life. I completely cast aside all of my chokhmah and I'm kicking into a muna. That's called Eretz Yisrael, not Eretz Canaan. That's called the Holy Land, not the land which is uh, covered over by bandits, which is difficult for us to conquer and we're suffering from all the time. That's the Da'at Ba'aretz. How do you bring Da'at into the Aretz? How do you bring the knowledge of Hashem into the land, meaning into your normative consciousness? You do it by talking to Hashem. The Rabbi Nachman says the entire key to Amuna of the land of Israel, of achieving Eretz, which represents faith, Amuna, and Israel, Yisrael, which represents Da'at, this higher consciousness, because we know Yisrael is Yaakov Avinu at the end of his life, after he conquered Esau, that is after he conquered all the negativity in his life, all of his doubts, all of the concept of nature. And then Yaakov went from being Ekev, the heel, to being Yisrael, Roshli. There's a head to me, meaning I've achieved this higher consciousness, the higher consciousness of the moon of Shlema.
So one thing that you could focus on in your hippo to do today is a very deep thing. It's taught in Kabbalah that the concept of the land is not just the physical land and not just the consciousness. It's also the concept of your body, which like we said before, is very fitting because just like your body has the same proportion of water and land as the physical universe, has physical mass and water, just like the universe does, so too is in your body because every person is an olam katan, is a small world. So too, the concept of da'at spreading over the world like water covers the sea is the concept of the knowledge of Hashem permeating every aspect of your body every aspect of your mind, of your heart, of your limbs, of your feet. Like Rabbi Nachman says, when is a muna hit its peak? When it enters into your fingers, into your toes, when it enters into your hands and feet and you're clapping and dancing. So this is a little take, uh, a spinoff on a meditation that I used to do with my clients and I used to practice myself when I was a clinician. Uh, this is called scanning. So what you're going to do is you're going to close your eyes and you're going to start in the beginning just by breathing out everything until there's nothing left. You can take a second. You're not going to do anything. And then you're going to breathe back in. Then you're going to hold it and you're going to breathe back out. So again, start by breathing everything out. Hold it. Breathe everything in. Hold it and out, okay? Now, while you're doing this, once you get used to it, and this kind of becomes muscle memory for you, then I want you to visualize the beginning of your body, the beginning of the land, the beginning of the arts for you, which has been conquered by Canaan, which you want to go take back now. You want to make it into Eretz Yisrael. So what you're going to do is, when you breathe out now and you, you're going to imagine your head, only your head. And what you're going to do is you're going to breathe out. And when you breathe out, I want you to imagine that all the darkness in your life and within yourself is leaving you. All of your belief in nature is leaving you. And you're going to hold and then you're going to take a breath in. And when you take a breath in, you're going to imagine that what you're breathing in is da'at. You're going to imagine that what you're bringing in is Hashkacha pratit. Yeah, you're breathing in the ore that Hashem hid away for the tzaddikim in the beginning of time. And he's going to bring back in the times of the Mashiach. The Baal Shem Tov gave us a taste now. The Rabbi Nachman gave us a little bit of a shower or a bath now before the Geula actually takes place. And I want you to imagine that you're breathing in ore. You're breathing in light. You're breathing in da'at. And it's entering into your head where it used to be teva and now it's a muna. And then once you feel your head relax and the muscles relax, then I want you to breathe out again. And now you're going to breathe out the teva, the nature of your eyes and everything that you see externally. And then you're going to hold and you're going to breathe in or you're going to breathe in da'at. You're going to breathe in amuna. And now you're not going to see with the light of teva. You're going to see with the light of amuna where everything is good, that everything comes from Hashem's love. Everything is to bring you closer to Him. And now you have rectified your eyes. And now your eyes feel light. And they don't feel heavy anymore. And they're not sad. And they're not crying anymore. Only tears of happiness. You're going to breathe out again all of the shtiyot that you've heard in your life about nature and science and atheism and evolution. And this is all that there is. And you're going to breathe in something deeper something spiritual, something infinite. Da'at, hashkacha pratit, the muna shlema. And you're going to breathe in a muna, and now all your ears hear is the beautiful, sweet whistle, the dodi dofek, the knock of Hashem's beauty, the Mashiach, that He's coming to save you. And you're going to go through your whole body like this, through your nostrils, through your mouth. You're going to go through your neck, your shoulders, your arms your chest, your stomach, your legs, your feet. And ultimately, if you continue to do this all the way down, it should take you anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes at least. But if you really allow yourself to do it, you could probably do it the whole hour. 
And, um, and you'll notice that if you're allowing yourself to, to move into the space and to expel all the darkness from each place, which we're calling the investment in Teva in each area of your body, and you are bringing in instead of the light of Avraham Avinu, the light of Chesed, the light of Da'at, so this is a geula of sorts. This is l'da'at ba'aret. If you're bringing da'at throughout the whole aret, throughout the whole land, throughout your whole body, this is the secret of what the Baal Shem Tov was taught by Mashiach. When your teachings go chutza minus echet chutza, when your teachings go chutza, meaning outside, which doesn't just mean outside into the physical world or outside into the places which would be least likely to get it, that's a part of it. But your body is an om katan. So the same thing needs to place take place within you, that is, that so to speak, your feet, your hands represent the extremities of the world. When those teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Nachman, that Da'at, enters into the externalities of your body, that's also Geula, that's also redemption. The second part, which you have time for, if you still have time for after that, is the second thing that we go over, that's Ana B'Koach, like we said yesterday, which is corresponding to the very special, unique Kabbalistic name of Hashem, which is 42, letters so this prayer that was given over um what is corresponding to the, the day of givura givura this is rinat that yesterday we said kabel which is to receive rinat that is our song and this is the secret rabbi nachman says of darkness in our life that the whole entire essence of singing comes from the left side. It comes from Givura. And where is this most explicit? Because it's taught in Kabbalah and Chassidut that the Levi'im represent the left side of spirituality. That the Kohanim are the concept of those who give over love. That's why they bless us with love every day, especially if you're Sephardic. If you're Ashkenazi, they do it a couple times a year. But the concept of the Kohanim is they're blessing us with love because the root of their souls is coming from chesed, okay? That's the revelation of godliness. Then you have the levi'im. The levi'im represent givura. Now on paper, even though that's the opposite function, that's the concealment of Hashem in our life, you see that what was their function in the Beit HaMikdash, the levi'im were the ones who sang. This is to show you that song comes from darkness. There is no way to play a beautiful song except to leave the darkness in your life. Rabbi Nachman explains this beautifully in the Kutim Aran, where he says, what is a song? A song is that what you're doing is you're taking a musical scale. And let's say, for instance, you're playing the guitar and you go from an E to an A to a D, if you know what those notes are. So what you're doing is you're choosing those notes because those notes go well together. And what you're doing at the same time is you're choosing not to play another note. So he says, if you think about it, what you're really doing is this deep spiritual Kabbalistic process, it's called biror. You're extracting, you're uplifting, you're elevating the good, and you are melting away all of the negativity in your life. You're picking the good notes and you are nullifying the bad notes, meaning the darkness. But the only way to do that, to extract good from bad, is if the good had fell in the bad to begin with. There is no way to elevate except if it has once fallen. So this is the whole concept of Givura, the whole concept of the Levi, the whole concept of the left side of the spirituality, which we resist, which we uh, run away from. But in truth, if you can enter into the experience and you allow yourself to realize that Hashem needs to be there also in the concealment, that today is Givura of Givura, that is the Chastar, Shabbatol Chastar, the concealment within the concealment. Nimsa Bavadai, that Rabbi Nachman teaches for sure 100%, Hashem Yiparach Hisham, He's there. Then it's Badafka in that experience of your own personal darkness that you can experience the greatest revelation of Hashem's light, that Hashem's even there. And this is another meditation to focus on. That all of the different challenges in my life, that if I think about them very deeply and I see how I've moved beyond them as time has gone on, this has really created the song of my life. And then instead of looking at all of the difficulties and challenges of your life as being this harrowing Holocaust-like experience, this Shoah-like experience where I'm slowly getting extinguished over time, that instead you can realize that Hashem is creating the most beautiful song with you, 
that were called Yisrael, which means Shir Kel, the song of Hashem. That all of these experiences of Yaakov Avinu is to bring him to Yisrael, to Shir Kel, to turn him into the most beautiful song. Like we know that the Mashiach is going to sing a song that was never sung before. What's the song that he's going to sing? The song of Amuna. This is the song that's going to sweep over the whole world. This is the song that has not been sung yet. This is the song that when you uplift all the darkness in your life and you see that really if you could look on the outside a little bit more objectively, you could see that really the song of your life has been written by the darkness and challenges in your life. This is a very beautiful meditation as well. Does anybody have any questions from today's class or from the two meditations which we brought at the end of the class? Uh, Rabbeinu? David Mayrov, is this a question or is this a statement? Statement, like what, what you said about that Hashem told Abraham Avinu to, to leave all the all those things that's dealing with nature behind, leave everything behind. It says in Parashat Lechecha, Vayomer Hashem El Abraham, Lechecha, Me Aretzecha, Umimolad Decha, Mibet Avicha, El Haaretz, Asher Hareka. He said to Abraham Avinu, Leave your leave your 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 land, leave your your father's house, leave everything behind to the to the land to the, that I'm gonna show you. To the land I will show you. Beautiful, David. You know what he was saying? Leave behind Teva, leave behind nature. Leave and behind go, to the, go to the land of Eretz Israel. The land of Emuna. Oh, you got it, David. Very good. Thank you. You made the whole day for me. You said that Eretz Israel is Emuna. Rabbi Nachman says it. I didn't say anything. I'm nothing. Um, Great, David. Good job. Any other questions from the Olam? Go over the last meditation. Just What's that again? again? Can you do the last meditation again? First one, I understand breathing in, breathing out. Was the last uh, meditation you're talking about? The, little, the, the last myself. meditation again was this. Uh, if everybody could just put themselves on mute. Thank you. The last meditation again was instead of looking at the difficulties and challenges of your life as only obstacles or obstructions to you experiencing good, to try and look back from the beginning until now, and you'll see that in reality, Hashem is creating a song with your life. And the song itself, teaches Rabbi Nachman, is coming from the darkness itself, because there's no way to create good notes except to take them from bad notes. There's no way to make a song except if you're taking the positive notes from your life and you're seeing how they resulted from the challenges in your life. Like, for instance, someone for me, I'll just give you a practical example. One of the greatest joys in my life is this right now, that I have the experience of teaching uh, such amazing, amazing people who I respect so much, who I consider brothers and sisters in arms, that I consider as heroes for having gone through everything that we have and continue to go through. And we're not just settling for... Um, you know, a limited type of gula. We're going for the, the whole shebang with Rabbi Nachman. So that's pretty epic. But that all started from my experience in the uh, psych ward. That all was given birth to from my constant uh, depressive episodes since I've been 10 years old that ultimately culminated in me uh, having suicidal ideation and finding myself uh, feeling like I've hit uh, mamish Gehenna hell and not, not thinking that there's any way back. And it was in that place that, uh, that I, I left nature behind in my life. And I, and I, gave, I gave myself up completely to Amun Shlema and to Hibodadut and to the Tzadik Yisur Olam and to Rabbi Nachman's teachings and wisdom and advice that Hashem is all that there is. And, um, and I left the land of Canaan and I left to the, went to the land of Israel, so to speak. So, but that all came from the darkness in my life. This whole beautiful song is the result of all that pain. And this is really the Kiddush of the Tilim, which Ashkenazim say when they make Berkat Amazon, which is really a reference to the Geula. But there's going to be a Shulchan Aruch, like Rabbi Nachman says, a fully set table. This is, the, um, this is hinting towards the redemption. When all Da'at becomes revealed, meaning when Hashem reveals to you everything in your life is for the very best, that's your fully set table. So when you say Berkat Amazon, it's like you're saying thank you on the whole thing because you're finally conscious. And it's in there that the Ashkenazim say in the beginning, the Shira Malot, that we are going back to Tzion like dreamers. And it says that we're carrying our sheaves of grain 
and that we are we have cried tremendously, but it's all turned into rena. It's all turned into song, because the whole concept of rena of song, this there's ten types of prayer. There's ten types of song. Rena is one of them. Rena, according to even shot the simple understanding is the type of prayer that comes from suffering. It's the type of song that comes from difficulties. It's not a regular type of shear. Rena is only coming from difficulties and challenges itself. Any other questions? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Um, Good morning. By the way, I also um, suffered very severely from bipolar disorder. And uh, it was a springboard, definitely was a springboard. But sure. it took, it took, takes a long time. But um, in any case, the Likute Maharan, do you know which teaching is the one that talks about the Levi'im and musical notes are birur, like you pick the good note from the bad? Um, okay, so first off, thank you for being so honest and sharing. Um, oh, yeah. Sure, yeah, I appreciate it. I'm sure everybody appreciates it here. I think one of the biggest obstacles that we have as people is to continue to pretend and have this facade like we've, we're perfect and we figured it out and we all really know how it's so not that. Um, so anyway, it's it, just to know that you're, uh, we're not alone, you know. Uh, is very healing. That's the first step to healing. That's why Rabbi Nachman says that we need to have sikhut there and we need to constantly speak with our friends. He says you can learn from your friends what you can't learn from your teacher, what you can't learn from your rabbi. So thank you first for that. Secondly, um, so there's a few different teachings that what I try to do is like when I'm giving over an idea, um, I try to synthesize different teachings of Rabbi Nachman or different things that I learn and bring it into one, one idea or one concept. Uh, that's, I'm not doing it, but Davka, I, I'm not, I can't take credit for anything like that. Uh, my mind just works like that. I remember somebody asked me like, how do you like go from there to there to there? That's just like the mind, the way my mind works. You know, my wife like doesn't like it so much because when it comes to doing basic things, it's not so helpful, <laughs> but I guess when it comes to teaching classes like this, there's a, uh, there's a benefit, but the, the concept of the Levi'im being the side of Givur or the left side, you can find that in Lukut Moran, Torah, Yud Gimel. He doesn't ah! use... <laughs> Yud Gimel, you did it. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't, he doesn't uh, reference it there in the context of um, them being the concept of Biror, right, extraction, but he does reference the concept of the song there. It's really speaking about business there. It's actually very connected in a very deep way, this whole thing that we're speaking about, song and business. Uh, but I, I can't make sense of it right now. The concept of Biror, uh, the Levi'im, the left side, all of that, that comes from another Torah in Rabbi Nachman's Torah, where he speaks about sheer song, music, being the concept of taking the good from the bad. This is the concept of Azamra, that famous teaching of Azamra. Um, there, I think maybe it was a commentary that I read where the song of the Levi'im, according to the person that was there offering the sacrifice, the singing was like on a minor note, like on a downward. And then as soon as Teshuva was accepted, then the notes and the musical scale and the timbre of the music turned into like an uplifting positive one. Wow. Amazing. I think I read that in Likute Maharan. Wow, I don't know. I didn't see that. Maybe I think you might have saw it elsewhere, but uh, I'll go back and check. It was beautiful. Well, Fit, just to fits hint, in very well. I've only read up to between number one and number 17. Okay, <laughs> so good. That'll beautiful. save you a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, Ruch Hashem. Okay, beautiful. Uh, Thank you so okay, much. Wait. So yeah, the last question I have for you, I hope that I'm not taking up a lot of time. Well, it's the second to last. Um, the two meditations, you the first one that you did and the second one that you addressed, do you have those recorded anywhere that we could listen? Or you no, they just they just came out of my heart. So you're gonna have to go back. Uh, we'll try to post the class as soon as possible. Uh, if you, if anybody, by the way, uh, I think one of the ways we can really take a big step as the Zion is if you guys realize that you're as big of a part of this thing as I am, and it's not about me, if you find an idea, if you find something that you feel like is worth sharing, write it down, record it, send it out. You know, this is the way that the light is going to shine when everybody takes their part and gives it out. 
So um, I don't have this recorded anywhere. It just it just came out of me. So I would just uh, visit the My wife will put up the classes after this class is over. If someone wants to write down those two meditations and then uh, maybe send them out to the groups and maybe we can even publish it on the website. So this is this is how uh, this is how the light's going to shine. OK, OK, that I love that. Um, and then number three about Tikkun Hatzot. Yeah. Um, one of Oda that I've been working on or thinking about for a long time. I know you're going to say just do it, but um, I get my second wind at 1030 p.m. OK. And I've read in some nutritional manuals and doctors, whatever, say the best sleep time is from like 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then I usually start at 1030 and then I don't get to sleep till one o'clock a.m. Okay. a.m. And then my whole day, then I wake up at 9 a.m. And then my whole day is like totally pushed over and it's like totally out of whack. So based on... Um, Hatsot or Tikkun Hatsot, is there a way that I could morph this dark habit into light? And does it count? Like if I stay, like I'm up already at midnight, like I'm not even near getting to bed. So 100%, 100%. I actually have the same thing. Maybe it has to do with the, uh, the other stuff that we've gone through. Yeah. Uh, but um but yeah, for 100%, you can definitely do Tikkun Chatzot. You don't have to fall asleep first in order to do it. You can literally, and I know people who do this, especially when it becomes more difficult, you can stay up until Chatzot, say Chatzot. You can capitalize on that time for sure. Um, and, and it's good. And what about the, about the bedtime Shema? Stay well, the bedtime, sh bedtime Shema, whenever you ultimately go to sleep. So you'll say the bedtime Shema. So Tikkun Atzot and then the bedtime Shema. Fine. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank very you very good. much. Thank of course. You. Have a great day. Anybody else? Ravino. You know Let's see if I anybody mean? else has questions, David. One second. Any other questions over here? Okay, Don, uh, David, finish us off before we go into tonight's Lukut Moran class. Give us something good. You know what the of Kabel Rinat Amecha Sagivinu Taharinu Nora? Say it again. Do you know what the Rashi Tevod of Kabel Rinat Amecha Sagivinu Taharinu Nora? Yes, yes, yes. You want to tell everybody? Kara Satan. Oh, we got to kill the Satan. We have Very to, good. We have to rip the Satan. How do we do it? With Amuna. Oh, very good. Okay. Everybody have an amazing day. I'll see you guys tonight at 9 p.m. Wait, Rabbi. Oh, out of the woodwork. Yeah. What's going on? Good, good, good. I just had a quick question to wrap up and get the day started. Okay, I didn't good. just wake up. Don't worry. Good morning, Ellie. Good morning, Phil and David. How are you? Oh, good. Good to see you. Come to Shachri tomorrow. I um, done Shahri by Rabbi Pinto. Okay, we don't need to know all your guys' business, guys. Let's do the. Uh, hey, Rabbi, Rabbi Kalman, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I guess when the little things happen, business deal goes bad. You get into an argument. Um, you get stuck in Teva. Do all of those circumstances have the same lesson to teach you um, to grow, or each lesson is specific. If you look into it, you'll find what the meaning behind it is. Because the suffering of the suffering is easy to go through when you have meaning in it. Yeah, hundred percent. It's both. It's on the one hand that there always is the same message of you're leaving Mitzrayim behind. You're moving to the land of Israel. You're moving to Amuna. And on the other hand, the Baal Shem Tov teaches and Rabbi Nachman brings down the Kutmaran. Every single day has its own specific thought, has its own specific um, speech, has its own specific action which is for you that day to get close to Hashem through, through those things. So it's both. Beautiful. So it's just to get closer and to daven and to beg him and ask him for 100%. Clarity. 100%. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.